Hey, welcome to another episode of Matbakh, our series all about food and drink from and of the Arab world. Um, it is a absolute honor to welcome our next guest, Nawal Nasrallah, who is a giant in this field. And it is so nice to be able to kick off the new season of Matbakh um, having Nawal on the series. Nawal is the author of Delights from the Garden of Eden and Annals of the Caliph's Kitchen, among other books, and is a historian and just an expert on the food from Mesopotamia. Nawal, welcome to Afikra. Thank you so much for uh, for having me, and thank you so much for the for this for your kind words. I'm curious, um, just to let's set the scene a little bit. Um, where did you grow up? Talk to me about what sort of relationship you had to food growing up. Um, I grew up in Baghdad, you know, uh, most of my adult, I mean, before I came to the States in 1990. And uh, my relationship with food, you know, because, was that I, I liked food. You know, my mother was a good cook and we were accustomed to having, uh, you know, nice treats, good food. So um, we grew up on this uh, culture. But uh, personally, um, I did not practice cooking you know, in the kitchen when I was a kid, you know, because we, we grew up in large families and uh, I belong to the younger generation. So we kind of were kicked out of the kitchen. They didn't need us. Um, but we enjoyed, my, I mean, we enjoyed my mother's food. I remember the gatherings, you know, the large gather, the gatherings along the, around the, the tray of food or the, and the table. And uh, there were certain foods that I liked that I asked my mother to cook, you know, uh, often. And uh, she obliged, which I am really <laughs> grateful for. It was only that I, um, you know, became, uh, you know, was away from home, you know, started my, uh, my own life that I started to learn how to cook. I was very inquisitive. I, I had the taste of uh, good food, you know, in my memory. So I wanted to replicate it. And uh, I kept on asking, you know, there was a good cookbook in there. It, it was, you know, like a traditional one, the uh, Lila Tabq al-Iraqi, which was my, uh, you know, my, my Bible. It's like the, uh, uh, you know, the uh, the art of cooking in uh, in America by, uh, uh, what's her name? I mean, you can cut this. <laughs> no, no, it's totally fine. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, the famous art of uh, cooking book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, and I, of course, I ask people when I uh, eat something good, I ask them and they tell me how to make it. I, uh, you know, also my family comes from, uh, from you know, I, I, I uh, was familiar with the different backgrounds of foods. My family came from Basra. I grew up in Baghdad yeah. and I taught for 11 years at the University of uh, Muslim. Uh, wow. So I learned all those traditions and we were, of course, we had some Kurdish friends. So we learned all, I learned all this kind of, you know, regional foods. And when I uh, came and, and my food, of course, was uh, uh, as an English, you know, I, I used to teach English yeah. and uh, I also had the books on uh, on English cooking. So what I was, <laughs> ironically, what I was famous for in Iraq were the, you know, like the American foods, like hamburgers. Uh, mashed potatoes and all these things. You weren't they famous them. for Abbasid and, hamburgers. You were famous uh, for yeah, American so, hamburgers. Yeah, but when I came here, I found this. <laughs> you know, my specialties are now I have to reorient my specialties here. So, and people also like them. You know, I cook. When I came to the States, I, I, I cooked my foods and I, and I, you know, I introduced yeah. them to our foods and they liked them. It was especially critical uh, for me because we came in 1990. Uh, these were uh, times of troubles, you know, in Iraq and all this period. So people, you know, um, you know, as a human being, to a human being, they wanted to understand Iraqis. I mean, other than the news on the on TV and on radios. So it was a kind of connecting with the real people of Iraq. So I started to be, um, you know, I started to get many questions about uh, what kind of food we ate. I didn't find it a trivial question or a superficial one. I found it like, a, you know, a kind of bonding with food and I respect it. And I, uh, of course, I um, I try to look for Iraqi cookbooks in the libraries, you know, the public libraries. I couldn't find any. 
um, there were lots of on Lebanon, on you know other, especially Lebanon, Turkey, and Morocco, but none on Iraq. So I decided to write a cookbook on Iraqi food. Uh, um, I have you know from my experience from reading uh, uh, cookbooks, I didn't like uh, to read only the recipe, the amounts, and the and the, uh, the, you know, the directions. I wanted to know something about the uh, the dish itself, about its background. Why is it called, called so? Why, I mean, how? what kind of people are interested in it? So I, you know, I decided to give a story to every uh, 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 recipe I give. And uh, um, the, the book started to grow larger and larger and um, not only that, not only recipe stories about recipes, but also about the. I wanted to trace the development of the Iraqi cuisine from the beginnings to to modern times, and I was and I was really, uh, you know, surprised, pleasantly surprised, I should say, with the with the amount of information we have yeah. on food from Mesopotamian times through the medieval times, and of course, I know I'm familiar with the modern. Uh, how much of what you were doing do you think was informed by your uh, education and sort of training in the world of literature? Uh, I think a lot. I mean, uh, I think food, history of food is a kind of literature. I mean, because it's also deals, I mean, it's not only a recipe, it's not only a practical, uh, you know, like, a, um, you know, a, you know, the uh, cooking of food. There are lots of things that are associated with, associated with food. Uh, it's history, it's culture, it's relationship to other cultures, you know, like it's just like connecting with the other. And um, I mean, there are the facets of food are, uh, there are countless. And uh, um, there are many ways, I mean, in which you can uh, tackle this uh, this particular subject which is, of course, necessary for our lives. I mean, we have to eat, so we might as well enjoy it. <laughs> and the fact that I uh, I was specialized, uh, my specialty was in English literature. I used to teach English literature and language at the universities of Baghdad and Mosul. And, uh, of course, I mean, it, uh, first of all, I was, uh, as a professor, I was, a, I, I love to do research. That's for, that was very important. Yeah. Um, my love for research, of course, instead of writing about uh, John Milton or Pope, I started to write about history of food. And uh, I've, I have the skill, you know, the research skill. So I applied it, applied it to, uh, to now to this, my a new, uh, uh, you know, uh, subject, which is uh, Iraqi food. So, uh, and of course, I used uh, some stories from what I learned from uh, um you know, the English uh, and English literature, and I try to uh, uh, see similarities between things. For example, I remember that I, my mother used to uh, tell us the story about the seven cucumbers, about the, uh, you know, it's a, it's a fairy tale about the seven, how, 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 how a beautiful woman came out of this, uh, of this cucumber, you know, after she was revived. And I was really surprised that there was this same legend in 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 Europe, but it was the oranges. It's about mm. oranges. So, um, or the story about uh, uh, you know Romeo and Juliet and the red mulberries. Um, so uh, you know it's all connected. I mean yeah. that was interesting. What what I found. How did you get into going from writing about sort of? Um, or just th the idea of putting together a cookbook um, and then going into the history of this, of the place and going into like medieval stories and Abbasid era. Um, Babylonian times. Babylonian times. <laughs> I mean, maybe, maybe let me ask a, a, a better question. And I. Yes. Okay. Th there's a better way of asking this question. What is the first Mesopotamian recipe? you came across where you said, this is not an Iraqi recipe, this is a Mesopotamian recipe. Okay, so let me start with the, the, the I mean, what what, what these uh, recipes were, where they came from. Yeah. Um, 
They come from three Babylonian tablets that were discovered uh, south of Baghdad, uh, close to uh, Babylon. And they were discovered in the 1930s. And uh, um, those who read them at the beginning, they thought that they were uh, medicinal or uh, pharmaceutical uh, tablets because they dealt with, uh, you know, with ingredients. Uh, but then John Botero, the French archaeologist, um, Assyriologist, the, the famous one, he deciphered them in the 1980s. And he discovered that those three cuneiform tablets were, in fact, uh, parts of a cookbook. And he, 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 I mean, these are only remnants of what was written at the time in the Babylonian times. They belong to 1700 BC. And of course, the fact that they, what they were documented in those uh, um, and those uh, uh, tablets, cuneiform tablets, they were written in Akkadian, the language at the mm. time. And the fact that they were documented, it means that this tradition was much, much older uh, than that. And it revealed really a very sophisticated cuisine. Um, so what, to answer your question, what really struck me was not only how Mesopotamian they were, but how much closer they, they, they were to what we are cooking now. I mean, I was surprised that uh, uh, the, uh, the main dish in Babylon in, Mesim, in, in ancient times was this too. Uh, and we know in Iraq, I mean, uh, we cannot live without this too. Marga or timmen, this is what we eat. Of course, we, I mean, we call it timmen, which has turned out to be an, uh, an ancient word, you know, and it's, it's a, uh, because otherwise it's called Rus or Arus. Yeah. We call it Timmen. Uh, so, of course, there was no Timmen at the time. There was, <laughs> was no Rus at the time. So they had it with the, with the bread. You know, like the, like the Thari dish we, he, we have yeah. uh, nowadays. It is like a stew with meat, with vegetables. And we soaked it, soak up some bread in it. This is Fetta. This is, uh, as we call it, Tashrib. Uh, tashrib in Iraq. Mm. So this struck me as really, you know, how come they ate the same, how come we eat the same food that we eat today? We love stew. It is uh, our, I mean, it's our staple. And uh, they cook it, of course, I mean, given the difference in the, you know, in the, this vast uh, period of time, yeah. given the discoveries later on, you know, with the tomato, with the other things, I mean, things of course, they do not remain static with the with the passage of time, but um, in spirit, the cuisine was, you know, similar to what we cook uh, today. Really? It is they they cook meat, they add vegetables, um, they um, and the seventeen hundreds, you know, seventeen hundred uh, BC, there was, for example, no black. They didn't have black pepper at the time. In order to add heat to, to their dishes, they use leeks and garlic. And uh, towards the end of each of most of the uh, stews, they used to grind uh, garlic and leeks. You know, leeks is kurraf. Yeah. You know, it, it's, it's hot like, uh, like onion. They used to grind them and add them to the pot for heat. We know that heat is good, is, is, is essential for food, and they realize this from medieval time, I mean, from some of the ancient times, uh, because it facilitates digestion throughout, you know, uh, even in medieval times. I mean, they all, we all believe that the, the stomach needs heat in order to digest. And they realized this from those uh, ancient times. So, um, of course, nowadays uh, we add black pepper or even for started starting from medieval times. But at that time, they added heat in this way, and uh, they used the different cuts of meat. Uh, they even used turnips, like lift. Uh, they used beets. Um, there are certain vegetables that we do not use nowadays, like other and, and other vegetables that were, you know, that went, you know, out of use. Um, but kamun. Mm -hmm. Kimono, even in the, in the, in the word itself, is a kimono, they, they, kusibaru. So even the, words yeah, are, kusibaru. even the words are quite similar. Yeah, kusibaru, which is kusbara. Um, and uh, what else? I mean, I found certain words that uh, are similar in, 
even I mean we even inherited those words, yeah. not only the the, the culinary uh, tradition. That was one tablet. It had like twenty five two recipes. Where there was that, the other. Tab- where is that tablet right now? It's a, a Yale collection, Babylonian collection in Yale, in Connecticut. Okay, and it's something that literally, if I yes. go to Yale, I can I can actually see the. Yes. Yeah. 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 You can have it. Have a look at it. It's really. I I I visited the uh, the, the 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 you know their collection. Yeah. And they were nice enough to take it out of the cabinet, and uh, I I held it in my hand. You know, after writing about it like like so many years. I just held it in my hand. It's just not big, you know. It's just like the like the palm, the size of the palm of the hand, and yet so much is written on it on both sides. So uh, I wanted to see the other side, so I turned it like we do with the you know the page of the book. Yeah. And she was standing behind me, the curator of the museum, and she said, "No, no, no. <laughs> this is not the way to turn the tablet. You turn it like this." Oh wow. <laughs> Yeah, you yeah, I didn't you know that. You wouldn't flip it this way. Yeah, it was. You do it like this. Yeah. So can I touch so screw like a, like a piece of soup? <laughs> so th- that tablet. Do you think it was used as? Was it created as an archival device? Was that why it was created, or was it an actual instrument? Okay, this is the thing to reference while cooking these stews. It's both. Uh, you know, the uh, the ancient uh, Mesopotamians were fond of documenting things. That's why we have so many things written uh, that survived from their culture. And uh, it is believed that uh, it, they were documented uh, for archival purposes, but also for uh, practical uh, purposes, that is for the trainees at the, at the temples, uh, so that, you know, to stabilize the uh, recipes, these were uh, you know, like the elitist uh, uh, recipes, and they were stabilized so that whoever comes will cook the dishes the same way, the way the uh, the elites like them, and the way the gods, uh, <laughs> their gods like them, because they used to offer their gods the same food uh, they offered the uh, the king and <laughs> how funny and his entourage. Okay, so also a question about the tablets: Do they have like quantities on them? Like this much kuzburao, uh, kuzubura, like oh, uh, I forget the word. <laughs> yeah, kuzbar, kuzbaru. Kuzbaru. Yeah, yeah. Kuzbaru. Uh, tough luck. No. Okay, so no, they're no. just saying these they, are the uh, ingredients no. that Berhal can figure no, it out yourself. I mean, we, yeah, yeah. Well, they don't because they. Uh, I mean, those. Uh, uh, I mean, we have to differentiate between the culture of cookbooks nowadays and the culture. Even during the, the 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 medieval times, nowadays we expect everything to be mentioned in the all 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 exact amounts to be mentioned. That is because we want we are addressing the audience that are not familiar with the with the food, and or or even when you uh, uh, it's, it is a you know a, a foreign uh, cuisine, you have to uh, you know learn a lot about about them about the ingredients about the ingredients don't take anything for granted i wanted to get away when i wrote my cookbook the delights from the garden of eden i wanted to get away get, get away from the amounts of salt i i most of all i said add as needed so my friend said you know she's american she said no 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 this is not going to work here you have to add exactly how much salt you add in this dish. Yeah. So uh, we have to, you know, at the time they did it because they assume professional cooks are going to use those recipes. Mm. They, I mean, they should know these things. Their taste buds should, should know yeah. these things. And if your taste buds don't know, you shouldn't be cooking. No, no. You are not, you're not in the right profession. You're in the wrong room. You can go find a different room to work in. Yeah. Yes. Um. You mentioned earlier that this idea that you, you know, Basra and Baghdad and Mosul. Um, and, and Kurdish, you know, it, we have Kurdish, Kurds friends. I mean, we visited so, the, the Kurdish on several so times. So how much does cuisine across um, 20th, 21st century Iraq differ from cuisine back then? Regionally, is there, are there huge differences that differentiate 
um, what a, a kitchen table would look like in Basra compared to Mosul? Uh, not to that amount. I mean, nowadays we see uh, distinct differences, but we, when you read those uh, uh, cuneiform tablets, you still see that they differentiated between what is uh, familiar to them and what, what belongs to the, you know, neighboring uh, regions. For example, there is an Assyrian dish. These are, you remember, I mean, at the time there were two, uh, uh, you know, uh, territories, the Babylonians uh, in the south and the, uh, and the middle of Iraq, and there were the Assyrians in the north. Those, those are Babylonian tablets. Yeah. So they give an Assyrian uh, recipe and they say this is Assyrian. And they give one from uh, Persia at the time, Elamite. Yeah. And they say this is an Elamite uh, recipe. So they were aware of regional differences. I mean, uh, that, which is enough coming from, uh, you know, uh, 1700 BC to, to see the differences. I think, that, I mean, this is really remarkable. Amazing. Um, okay, I want to talk about Kitab al Tabikh. Um, can you give us just a, a background about who wrote this cookbook, when it was written, and why you decided to translate it? Uh, we, when you say Kitab al Tabikh, we have to differentiate between two books titled Kitab al-Tabiyyat that came from Baghdad. Uh, there is Kitab al-Tabiyyat 10th century by Ibn Sayyar al-Warraq, and there is Kitab al-Tabiyyat by, uh, by al-Baghdadi, also written in, in Baghdad, uh, in the 13th uh, century, like, you know, like 30 years or something before the uh, Mongols' attack of, uh, of Baghdad. So what the, the book I worked on was the uh, 10th century one. It is by Ibn Sayyar al-Warraq, which is a major volume. It's about, it, it is 132 chapters. And it really anthologizes the cuisine of, uh, uh, at the time, you know, the uh, Abbasid uh, cuisine. Um, you asked me why I decided to translate it. And this all comes from my research, the research I did for my delights from the Garden of Eden. <clears throat> the, this, this, you know, this uh, adventure that I uh, undertook in in in, uh, in, 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 in in putting together this book took me to the Babylonian times, as we said. You know, the, I discovered the uh, Babylonian tablets, and I also discovered that uh, during the Abbasid period um, in Baghdad, uh, the, a book came, a major book. Uh, it's also called Kitab al Tabikh. Kitab al Tabikh, that's a general it's, name. It's, you know, it's like cookbook. <laughs> it means cookbook. Yeah, yeah like cookbook. Yeah. <laughs> so we have to be careful when we, uh, we have to, yeah, because we know the author. Yeah. Of course, we know only his name, Ibn Sayyar al Warraq, but who he was, what did he do? Nothing. Yeah. Just this. Um, and it is ironic that uh, uh, Ibn al Nadim, in his Fihrist, he mentions like, uh, you know, many books that were written by celebrities, caliphs, uh, physicians, and 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 and, uh, and princes, and all that, but none of them survived. You know, from this period. But this book, even Sayyar al Warraq, survived, and he didn't mention him in his uh, in his, uh, uh, you know, uh, fihrist. Mm. Um, but what is really important about uh, al Warraq? Is that he uh, gave? Uh, it is he didn't. Uh, he wasn't a cook apparently, but he was commissioned to write this book for a uh, for a dignitary, and he wrote it. Uh, he said, "I wanted you to uh, when you read this book, you you wouldn't need any other books." Mm. So he wrote about the uh, the powers of food, the you know all the the the, the nutritional uh, the the uh, the med medicinal uh, aspects of food and and, and be their benefits and also about cooking. And he um, he credits his recipes. Most of the recipes were credited, and from 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 which we learn that um, you know. From 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 the recipes he he mentions, we learned that what Ibn Nadim said about those cookbooks was really uh, you know accurate because uh, they were written by uh, by professional cooks 
by a princess, especially Ibrahim bin al-Mahdi, half a brother of Harun al-Rashid. Um, oh. By, by uh, some books were written for, for caliphs like al-Ma'mun and al-Rashid and others. So he did us a great favor, but uh, by including those uh, recipes, because he, in a way, preserved the uh, uh, Abbasid cuisine, although not complete, of course. I mean, just the two, two, the two recipes from here, three recipes from there. But this is enough to tell us about, uh, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the advanced level that the cuisine really uh, attained during that period. So this is it's important. It's like an anthology. If you read it, it's an anthology of... Uh, it's like a gastronomic anthology. Yeah. How much of food history from centuries past, when we look at the recipes and we look at any any uh, evidence about how people were cooking at the time, how much of it tells the story of different social classes? Is Are these basically telling the stories of the dignitaries and the rich who have chefs in the kitchen? Well, and does it also tell the stories of normal people who are just getting by and don't really have a lot of um, extra extra money? Principally, those books, of course, are addressed uh, towards the uh, you know the elitist uh, groups. Yeah. Uh, because we have to remember that cookbooks were not cheap, and the paper. Uh, I mean. Um, I mean, they were only. Uh, I mean, uh, I mean. Nowadays, we know that uh, cookbooks are, 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 you know, they are very popular, and everybody has access uh, has access to them. But at the time, because of their prices, I mean, they were uh, either commissioned, and they were, of course, inscribed by hand. So the recipes of necessity should be very, very uh, limited. Only the uh, you know, the popular ones were uh, copied and recopied like uh, the ones that uh, um, that survived. Yeah. And um, we know that cookbooks are not written for, uh, you know, for, you know for, for people who do not have money. I mean, for those people, I mean, there, there are certain dishes that they cook and, uh, of course, within their means. But uh, those recipes, they, they are uh, demanding. Lots of uh, spices, yeah. lots of lots cuts of meat, and uh, um, they were, uh, you know, directed towards those who can to have access to uh, this kind of luxury. Um, but we also come every now and then we come across recipes um, that uh, were cooked and loved by the majority of people. But also the, uh, I mean, that were the, the elites were also interested in them. So, um, for example, uh, a, a, a dish that, that was famous at the time is judaba. Uh, judaba, the idea of judaba is that uh, they make a casserole, like a bread casserole, and they drench it in, uh, you know, a sweet syrup. And they put it in the bottom of the, of the tanur, you know, the, the, the clay oven. And they suspend a large chunk of meat, either a chicken or a whole lamb or, a, or mm. a, you know, like a, or just a chunk of meat. And they let it drip all its juices and fats and, and you know, into, the, into this casserole. And when it is done, they will shave the, the, this meat into, uh, you, know, uh, you know, thin pieces like we do with shawarma. And they will, you, I mean, you will take part of this, uh, you will eat it with this, uh, with this uh, uh, casserole, bread casserole. It's like very nice, like a uh, sweet, savory dish, you know, yeah. like the pastilla dish in, in Morocco. This is sweet and, uh, and savory. Okay, so this was an elitist dish. But if you go to read Maqamat al-Hariri, for example, one of the stories deals with the, uh, a farmer who goes out to the food market and um, he was, uh, the, you know, I mean, he was uh, the, uh, deceived by one of the, I mean, uh, he, 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 I mean, he was, uh, uh, what, what do I say? He was uh, f- swindled? Yeah, Is swindled, it swindled, bamboozled, tricked. Yeah. Okay, so we will repeat. <laughs> so it deals with the story of uh, uh, a farmer who has just uh, 
sold his uh, crops or something and he has money. And the swindler, uh, of course, uh, noticed this, took notice of this. So uh, he pretended that he is, he knows him. Oh, oh, how are you? Don't you remember me? I remember your father. <laughs> how is your father? <laughs> Come, 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 let me take you to the food market. Let us eat something. Let's have a meal. So they go to the food market and they order judaba, you know, this dish. So it was in the food market. Uh, everybody had access to it. And apparently it wasn't really terribly expensive. I mean, uh, even the commoners could, uh, uh, you know, could, uh, you know, they, uh, they afford it. Of course, needless to say that this <laughs> swindler, it's pretended that he has to go to go and drink some water or something, and then he vanished. And he made the farmer pay, pay for the meal. Poor guy. How funny. Yeah. Um, okay, I want to talk a little bit about how much food changed over the period. So if I imagine I was just doing like a blind taste test, okay? I lead you into a kitchen. I, I, I close your eyes. And I've made, you know, four different meals. One from the last few hundred years, one from uh, the medieval time, and one from uh, the Abbasid sort of... Um, uh, Today? <laughs> yeah. And so, like, across the, the span of the hundreds of years that you have, ta that you have studied, what are yes. the things that would indicate to you what came from different periods of time? If I'm only looking at Iraq, what ingredients or techniques or flavors or spices would you say, oh, this is clearly an Abbasid dish? Um, let's start with the Babylonian times. Sure. Of course, we have the recipes of ancient times. Well, for example, as I said, the absence of certain spices like black pepper today, I mean, black pepper is indispensable. It's everywhere. So why are they not using it? Because it was not, there are, there are certain, certain things that were not available. So this is the absence, for example, of black pepper. Uh, when did black pepper the, uh, start becoming available? Yeah, like in the, um, the first uh, millennium uh, BC or something, the, uh, or the first millennium, you know, around that period, around the turn of the, of the millennium. But uh, this was 1700, so uh, closely, I, I mean, uh, recently after that, I think it came to reading because we know it was used by the Romans. The, the Romans also, the Byzantines, they also loved this, uh, this spice and it was documented. Okay, so... Um, Certain recipe, certain ingredients I do not see. I, we do not use that nowadays, like the dodder, some I, unidentified uh, things. It is more apparent. The change is more apparent when we can, when you come to the um, uh, medieval times. Um, we notice that they use murri uh, very often. Murri is a, a liquid fermented sauce. Okay. It, you know, it's similar to what the Asians use nowadays, the soy sauce. And they use it in their uh, savory dishes. Uh, this is what they uh, mostly favor, uh, flavor it with. Uh, sometimes, uh, I mean, salt is not mentioned in the recipes because when they use murri, because it is salty and we understand that uh, the dish doesn't need it. Um, they use saffron a lot. Uh, they like this color and they like to color them. Mm. They like to thicken their stews with the uh, like uh, almond uh, flour, uh, chickpeas, uh, sometimes rice. As we come to our modern, uh, you know, like the modern stew, we, you see that it is, uh, in, in looks, it is different. It is red because you use tomato. Uh, we don't really use that much saffron, first of all, because it's not available, you know, yeah. and it is uh, expensive. And um, so that is the, the, and we use other uh, vegetables like potatoes, uh, whereas eggplant, for example, has been there from ancient times, you know, it was a favorite, has been a favorite vegetables. And tomato, I think, made a big, big change in the way we cook our stable, this too. In medieval times, they used to uh, make them, color them yellow. 
Of course, yeah. they they didn't leave them just white. You know, they 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 had to add color. They uh, they, they 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 used saffron. I I heard uh, that they, they used to use them. eggplant. Am I wrong about that? Instead of like many eggplant? dishes yeah. where there is tomato, they yeah, used to use yeah. yeah, yeah. They were called buraniya. That is with because uh, there is the um, the story that buran was favored, and either she invented it or she she liked it, and it was you know. Um, made for her uh, a lot. Yeah, it was like uh, the dish, the, the, uh, you know, fried, fried eggplant, sometimes with meat. I mean, we make those casseroles nowadays yeah. with the, with the yeah. eggplant sliced and fried. Um, so they, they like to uh, sour their uh, stews with the juices, uh, like sumac, uh, lemon juice, uh, what else? You know, orange, uh, the sour uh, orange, whatever is available, vinegar, and they liked the flavor of sweet and sour. Uh, so they added like honey in, if, if, they, if they make it sour to not much, but just to, to balance the, uh, the flavor. So this sourness and, uh, and also because they, 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 they use this, uh, they use this murri because of its umami, uh, you know, uh, flavor. Nowadays, we know what this flavor is. Yeah. We call it umami. But at the time, they, um, they, 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 I mean, they, the, the, the cooks realized that this, or oh, this uh, murri really adds something to the dish. They, perhaps they couldn't pinpoint it, what it was, but it was something. Al-Jahaf, for example, called, called it Jauhar al-Ta'am. Jauhar is the essence. It is the essence uh, uh, of food. Uh, so besides this essence of food, the umami, and, and, and um, I mean, by the way, this umami flavor was also available in, in, in ancient Mesopotamian times. They used uh, fermented sauce, uh, but it was different. It was called seppu. It was made from uh, uh, small fishes, you know, fermented small fishes, and they, they extract this, ex- this johar, <laughs> johar tam, uh, uh, from it. Uh, but in medieval times, the murri was basically made with the grains. It was a grain-based. I mean, uh, yeah. which was, you know, because grain grew uh, abundantly and they, and they used uh, it. Have you, have you tried making all of these dishes? And do you like any of them? Do you like them? I mean, or do they taste strange um, to... Not all of them. I mean, they are like a hundred, like more than 600 recipes. And no I, cannot, of me. <laughs> I mean, well, it's, uh, I like the eggplant dishes. I try them. I mean, when I make demonstrations for uh, for students, for, for my, uh, you know, for my my, my, yeah. uh, com- my presentations, I make some of the dishes and uh, they are really lovely. Uh, even they made sandwiches, for example, you know, like uh, rolled uh, sandwiches. Okay. Um they called them the basma words. They called them, uh, uh, you know, uh, they, they even made open-faced uh, uh, sandwiches, different kind of sandwiches. I made them all uh, and people like them. I, mean, I like them. So if you, were to, if you from... were to put together a list of like the top five, um, maybe not ancient, but top five dishes from the past from Iraq through your uh, through your research, what would be these five dishes that you say, these are not popular yeah, anymore, would, but you need, say, you need to try I would, them? Yeah, I would say the basma work, the, the, this, this, those uh, sandwich rolls, pinwheels. I call them pinwheels, you know, because mm. we make it like a, a log, you know, we, are, we roll the bread and then we cut it into slices so it becomes like a pinwheel. Yeah, yeah I like the, those sandwiches, the um, uh, basid sandwiches. Um, I like uh, badinjan mahshi, which is a kind of, um, you know, uh, uh, dip, you yeah. know, nowadays we make, uh, uh, you know, b- 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 uh, no, sure, uh... yeah, but we make your know, different dips with, with eggplant, yeah. uh, like baba zanuj, uh, but they make it, they called it mahshi and it is made, uh, you know, it's really tasty. I mean, uh. I have made it several times. I mean, and people tell me, why aren't we cooking eggplant this way anymore? Um, there's also something nice, a very nice dip that in Al Warraq, which is uh, about uh, fava beans, uh, a fava bean dip, you know, uh, fresh fava beans. Uh, they are boiled and mashed, and of course, with lots of other, uh, 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 you know, ingredients. And uh, you can dip them like hummus, but Is it like, uh, it's, it's like it's food, really... basically? 
it's like is it like fool basically like a modern uh, an ancient version of fool um it's not a tamin yet it's not a fried okay. it's a dip it's like hummus yeah 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 and it's not a hummus there's no tahini but there is a uh, fool yeah. you know the fava beans you know the green fava beans and it's 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 really nice i mean with nuts they use nuts a lot and uh, so so far and uh, when i make uh, our cookie the kletcha it is not uh, really different from the uh, the 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 cookies they made in uh, they called khushkananaj i mean in uh, in the levant for example they make uh, ma'mul yeah in Iraq, we make a kletcha. When I read the recipes in Al Warraq, it is not really any different from from how we prepare our kletcha these days. So uh, you know, there are dishes that are really and you can really easily connect with because you know it's uh, it's uh, it shows that how little uh, it changed. Oh, I like the uh, stool uh, Romania, yeah, uh, where you can make meatballs. Yeah. Um, or uh, I mean, pomegranate juice, and uh, it's 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 really a lovely, uh, uh, you know, a lovely uh, stew. So there are lots of dishes that you can make, you can enjoy, and you wouldn't think that this is a foreign. Uh, I mean, this is uh, this is our food. I mean, this, except that it doesn't have tomato paste, for example. What what it doesn't have tomatoes as we do today? Yeah. Um. Can I ask you a little bit about the kitchen itself? What would an, a medieval kitchen look like in Iraq? Like, what are the utensils? What is the heating device? What is the refrigeration alternative? What did a kitchen look like in medieval Baghdad? Okay, when we talk about the kitchen, of course, we have to think about the, uh, the kitchens of the affluent. Sure. Um, I mean, um, first of all, you've got to have, uh, uh, you know, running water in order to wash all the things and the, to keep all things clean. Uh, because they thought, I mean, um, they were so meticulous about uh, washing their uh, pots, for example. And there are certain, uh, in, the, in, the, in the introduction of Ibn Sayyar al-Warraq, there are a few pages where he describes how to clean pots properly. Because... Um, they use the, I mean, nowadays we use steel, we use other, those, uh, other metals, but they used uh, pottery. And pottery is pot porous. And if the, some of the, what they call zephyr, you know, the, the, uh, the greasy, well, the greasy things that were left from cooking, if they stay in the pores, they would uh, really spoil the food yeah. when you cook in them later on. So, Ibn uh, al has a, has a very, uh, a nice way of uh, you know ensuring that the clean uh, that the pot is clean after you know a laborious uh, you know after repeatedly washing this uh, this pot um, he says uh, put a stone and in, in, in one of the, your nostrils and smell the pot in the other nostril if they smell the same then the pot is clean <laughs> which makes sense which makes sense because the stone is a clean. You yeah. know, it has a clean uh, smell. <laughs> it's, it's not. It doesn't have any zephyr. How funny! So, yeah. <laughs> so they use different kinds of uh, pots. Um, like some of them are pottery. Some of them are made of soapstone. Uh, some of them are made of copper. Um, they use copper, not not you know for frying or uh, cooking stews that have sour, uh, uh, you know. Uh, ingredients in them because they 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 know about the reaction that happens between uh, between copper and 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 uh, you know acidity yeah uh, poison um they use these for for example when they slaughter a whole uh, sheep and they want to remove its wool they would dip the the sheep in this uh, boiling water in this qidr uh, nuhas uh, in order to uh, remove it, uh, so I mean, it's, it, so that it doesn't affect uh, uh, their health. Um, they used lots of uh, uh, balls, different uh, sizes of balls. Some of them, uh, I mean, if you go to, uh, like, for example, Nissan and Arab, they he will uh, mention different kinds of balls. This ball is enough for ten people. That ball is enough for five people. So. 
All those, of course, we have to understand that, but all those bowls were, were offered at the table as kind of communal dishes. Mm. They were shared by uh, by people. I mean, they do not like and and, and they do not eat uh, in different. I mean, each in a different on a, in a different bowl or a different plate. They were communal, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, dishes. So they were large, uh, especially the sarid uh, bowls. They were they're supposed to be large. And the meat should, uh, I mean, it was, I mean, they were supposed to spread it all around the, the top. And of course, by the way, this necessitated, because you share a meal, you have, there are certain rules, you know, uh, etiquette that has, you have to follow when you, like when you eat with the others. Oh, like what? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there is a, there is a chapter in, in Al-Warraq that tells you how to eat properly when you are with people. For example... I if feel you, like, by the way, Nawal, uh, I feel like my grandmother wrote this book. <laughs> yeah, I know. It sounds familiar. Uh, for example, he says, if you, if you covet uh, a piece of meat that is far away from you, don't go to it. <laughs> I mean, you shouldn't really reach to the, to the other side of the, of the bowl. It's not good manners, you know, to, to do these things. Also, you shouldn't speak a lot when you eat so that, you know, I mean, you should. Uh, does, it, yeah. does it also say that you shouldn't take the last bite and that you should leave plate uh, in, uh, food uh, in every plate? You know, no, we didn't say this. I think because of, I mean, generosity necessitates that you should have so much that you shouldn't finish the, what is in the, in the pot. There should always be, remain, you know, something in the, of the food. So interesting. Also, something else. Yes, you shouldn't lick your fingers because they use their fingers. They didn't use uh, spoons. Yeah. They shouldn't lick their fingers or something. I mean, all kind of uh, uh, common sense things that uh, people have to mind when they share a meal. Okay, so now we go back to the kitchen. Yeah. Um, of course, they had uh, the the ladle uh, was important because they used it to stir the dishes and to uh, you know ladle the food into the bowls. Um, what about okay. keeping, yeah, keeping kind things of, fresh kind of, and making sure that they so, don't spoil? Yeah, couple. Excuse, excuse I said, me? what about keeping things fresh and making sure that they don't spoil? Okay, uh, that was uh, really tough. I mean, uh, they didn't have any refrigeration, so um, I think they they that's why they had to cook daily, mm. and. Um, they, uh, there are only a few things that uh, things were uh, safe when kept like, uh, you know, overnight. For example, those basma were those sandwiches, you know, the pinwheels. Uh, they say that you can keep them overnight. They do not, uh, you know, spoil. Um, we know that in, their, in the houses they, they, they lived in, that there were certain places that, uh, uh, that were breezy. And they kept the uh, the air changing, and uh, um, there were cooler places in the in their mm. houses than the than the kitchen, for example. Um, and in Iraq, we call it bad gear. You know, it's a kind of shaft that goes up to the uh, to the wall, and it circulates. It it keeps the uh, so the wind the, the the air that comes through this is is cool, and that is where they keep their things. As also the basements are also cool. Uh, otherwise, you know, they have to cook the, whatever is left. I mean, whatever they have uh, uh, shopped for the day. Super interesting. Can I ask you a question about the connection to food and wellness or medicine and how much they understood at the time about health and nutrition and um, if that was also featured in these, in these cookbooks? Oh, they knew a lot. Uh, for example, let me give you an example on Ibn Sayyar al Warraq uh, cookbook. I mean, the, it was overlooked. I mean, when it was first discovered, the manuscript, it was overlooked because when they looked at the, um, um, the first 20 chapters, or, or I mean, the, yeah, I mean, the first 20 chapters, but what they, I mean, when they looked through the opening chapters, they thought, oh, that's a medicinal book. It's about medicine, about nutrition. And they didn't categorize it as a cookbook. Um, they knew a lot. And they were influenced by the, uh, uh, the theory, uh, by the Galenic theory of the humors. 
the four humors, like the and you know uh, and the four elements and the uh, that everything in this world is governed by those by the properties of those uh, uh, of those uh, uh, of those elements. Even the body has, you know, uh, I mean, we have four kinds of uh, of people. Yeah. Uh, People who are, uh, you know, phlegmatic, people who have a black bile, people who are uh, yellow bile or a blood. So they knew the differences in uh, people's de- temperaments. And they, uh, of course, according to the Galenic theory, um, you can accommodate this, the, your foods in order to suit your health so that you do not get harmed by it. A simple example, I mean, uh, on the, uh, for example, in, 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 in times of uh, illness, like especially in fevers, um, the thing, that, I mean, the, we know that the, I mean, the logical thing to do is to give them uh, cold foods. Of course, we do not, they do not, they didn't mean that cold in a matter of heat, but in matter of properties. They are cold in properties, as, like Qara, for example, the gourd. Uh, it is cold in the properties. Even today, we think qara is uh, is a cold uh, uh, vegetable, unlike eggplant, for example, yeah. which is which is hot, and you should be careful when you uh, when you eat a lot of it. So they 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 uh, really were very well educated concerning this respect, and uh, I mean they they um, everybody was uh, who was knowledge. I mean who. Uh, you know, who was uh, kind of reasonably educated, should know these things and should uh, accommodate the food uh, he eats according to to suit his own uh, uh, temperaments. Um, and this is, of course, reflected in yeah. cookbooks. I mean, because they thought that you uh, you cook, you not only for, I mean, you offer food not only to uh, to, you know, for enjoyment, but also to maintain your health. Uh, they thought that the cook was responsible. I mean, they had professional cooks, their own household uh, uh, cooks. So their house, their household uh, cooks were responsible for catering to their uh, to their appetites, but also to their health needs. Yeah. I mean, um, so they had to know about this. Uh, uh, the principles of this, uh, they are simple principles and they had to master them in order to, uh, you know, uh, avoid harming the, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, to prevent them from indulgence and from, uh, indul- I mean, indulgence in the wrong kinds of yeah. foods. Um, okay, before we wrap up, I want to ask you uh, our f- four sort of quick Q&A questions for, for the Matbakh series. Um the first one is, what are you reading uh, these days? Oh, what's that much think I, I, I had a little time to read. Other than, I mean, I have been busy uh, uh, translating the, uh, the, the second Andalusian cookbook, and uh, I have been uh, really full-time uh, trying to, uh, uh, you know, to... Uh, prepare the images for the book. So for the last two months or three months, I, this is what I have been uh, uh, doing. Uh, but also every now and then, you know, I like to write, to read. I mean, you see this, this I library, I buy books and <laughs> and keep them uh, so that, you know, whenever I have time, you know, when I go to the visit, to an appointment, I take a book with me and read. Uh, I'm reading, for example, this book on uh, on Anthemus. He is the sixth century uh, Byzantine. Uh, uh, you know, he wrote. He's a physician who wrote a, a, a small cookbook. So I, I'm trying to see, you know, a certain. I mean, interested about the uh, how cuisines, you know, how, how how they did in 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 pre-Islamic times. Yeah. So you know, I read bits from here, bits from that, but I, I'm basically I have to focus on my, uh, you know, on my book now. When it comes out, of course, I will read the rest of the books. I'm curious, you know, you've you have published so much and you've done so much work, um, whether it's on the Mamluks or Hadla Andalusians, you've done so much stuff on Iraq. I'm curious. I'm calling you from Beirut in Lebanon. We. Um, tend to be very arrogant, rightly so or unrightly so, that our food is the, is the best food, right? We say this all the time. And many people say that the food, their food, their cuisine is the best food, right? 
I'm curious, in the medieval time, do you think that um, the writers that you were reading, that you're reading now, thought that, oh, food from Mesopotamia is clearly superior to uh, Egyptian or Andalusian food or uh, food from, you know, uh, modern day Tehran or the steppes? I mean, did they have any sense of arrogance that what they're doing is so much better than everyone else? No, that's, that's really an excellent question because in the uh, cook in the cookbook and that is the cookbook I uh, translated the uh, by Ibn Al Tujib uh, Tujibi's cookbook Fi Dharat Al Fiwan Fi Taibat Al Ta'am Wal Alwan. Of course, he's from Al Andalus and he's a, a well-known scholar. And uh, in his introduction, he said things that are kind of uh, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> he said he said, he thinks that the Andalusi cook is the best. And that whatever is cooked in Al Mashriq is disgusting. It's I don't he said, I don't know how they eat it, but that's because it is it is their it is their nature, they are accustomed to it. But he thinks it's disgusting. <laughs> Not only that, I love it. he also differentiates between Andalus, you know, Andalus the Andalus itself that is in the uh, the Iberian, the southern Iberian and the and North Africa. Uh, there is some busek. Yeah. Uh, for example, we know that nowadays we know that it's, it's it's cooked with meat, you know, or vegetarian or something. It's a savory thing. But in Al Andalus, sambusak to them is like marzipan. Mm. It is uh, uh, cooked with the uh, almond. It's, it's like almond paste, Yummy. and he, they called it sambusak. And he said, and <laughs> the recipe at the end of the recipe, he said, "This is the true sambusak." Look at what the North Af what the Af <laughs> in North Africa how they cook it. It's disgusting. It's very, he's so opinionated. <laughs> I mean, it's funny. I don't know what's what, what, I love what, it. Why is it going? I love the trash talk, the medieval trash talk. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but now yeah. with the the uh, the benefit of hindsight, the luxury of hindsight, when you look through these texts. Who do you think had the best cuisine at the time? Yeah, I mean, they were all good. Uh, they had their strong points. I think all the dishes they uh, they 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 documented they were they were the best of what was at the time in the region, and uh, I love them all, of course. Um, I don't find them weird. Sure. I mean, uh, Let me but they were some of them were so laborious that are you know i i they wouldn't cook that kind of cook them in, in my if kitchen. i told you noel i want to uh to thank you for this episode i want to take you out to dinner and you have oh. an, a medieval andalusian restaurant a medieval egyptian restaurant something from the levant something from mesopotamia north africa all these different options which restaurant yeah. are you saying akid i'm going to that one i want to go to this medieval version uh, could you take me to them all Breakfast, lunch, dinner. <laughs> we take appetizers here. We take the main dish here. Desserts from Savory here. Savory sambusik so, here. Uh, sweet sambusik yeah, there. Yeah. Okay. No, I mean, if, 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 if perhaps I shouldn't listen to it. Yeah. <laughs> Savory sambusik is good. Um, okay, three more quick questions. Uh, who would you love to shadow for a day, past or present? Al Warraq. Ibn Sayyid Al Warraq. I'd really like to see how he wrote his book. I'm really interested in yeah, this. Yeah, for sure. How he wrote it, where he found his material, all those books. Did he go to a library like Al Jahl used to do? I mean, you know, they used to rent a whole library and read, you know, for, for a few days, for a week until they uh, get the material they need. I don't know how he got his, ma his material, all those poems, all those stories. It's a pity that we do not have those books. I mean, uh, it must have been an amazing library that he went to yeah. where he found all those books. Amazing. Um, what is your guilty pleasure midnight food choice? I haven't done this midnight choice for a long time, but I have fancies. Ah, oh, Zalabia. You know, dripping with honey, <laughs> dripping with syrup. This is, you know, what I really crave <laughs> So funny. You know, there's the Nabia, the latest uh, Mushabak. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. 
I really, I mean, because when we are kids, we used to uh, break it into pieces and we suck on those, you know, those uh, tubes and all the, all the juice will come out. I, I really would like to, but I, I can't. <laughs> and the last question is, what dish reminds you most of home? Banya. Okra. Okra dish. Yeah. <laughs> this is our favorite dish, you know. How do you, how this do you is prepare? What we Tell us some... how you prepare a, a Bamiya dish. Oh, uh, yes. Well, nowadays I buy it frozen. So I have, for, so, for example, to cut off both ends because we do not keep those both ends. We have to keep them so that some of the emucilaginous, uh, you know, this sticky substance comes out. Um, so first of all, I, uh, I try to fry as a uh, few uh, cloves of garlic and olive oil and um uh, a tomato juice, tomato par- tomato paste, so that it caramelizes yeah. and smells nice. And then um, I add the some water. I add the uh, and I the okra and uh, lemon juice. That's it. I mean, we don't and add salt. We don't even flavor it. It has its own yeah. flavor. Now you ask me about about meat. Uh, meat here, of course. I, uh, I I like to cook it. I, I always cook it with lamb. But I have to cook it separately uh, in order to get rid of the fat because uh, it's, it's so bad, you know, lamb is fatty. So I cook it in a small amount of water until um, uh, it's uh, all the liquid evaporates and what's left, the, the fat I throw away. I remove all the, the, the you know, the fat that is, that, has, uh, that is remaining and then I add it to the, uh, to the pot. Um, Sometimes I would like to sprinkle it with some, uh, uh, you know, uh, river mint, uh, uh, which is called, which we call uh, uh, botnage. I don't think it's used by. Uh, is it, I mean, it's river mint. Yeah. yeah, you don't use it, but you can use uh, mint. You know, dried mint. You sprinkle it uh, on it, and uh, the, of course, uh, we like to have it as thread. We break pieces of tanur bread. The flat bread and, uh, uh, you know, uh, soak up the bread in it and it's a broth with the meat, with the, with the, um, with the okra and the garlic. And garlic is a big thing in, 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 in okra. They have to be whole in the skin. Um, and of course we hold the, uh, the, 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 the garlic clove and, and we just squeeze it into our mouth, you know, the whole luscious uh, inside of the, of the cooked garlic would, would just melt in your mouth. It's really a, a unique experience. Amazing. Noel, thank you so much for doing this. Um, oh, yeah, welcome. It was such a, such a pleasure. <laughs> everyone, please go out, check out Noel's uh, many, many books. And inshallah, we'll have a part two at some point to discuss more about uh, Mamluk. And I also want to talk to you about your da- book about dates at some point. So. Oh, yeah. Um, Thank you so much. Thank you so much.